Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the VSI Sporting Directors podcast with our friends at Omni Sports. It's fair to say in the past few years, football business has become show business. Everyone's an expert when it comes to football finance and the finances in sport in general. But let's pilot through some of those murky waters with two proper skippers, people who know what they're doing. Uh, one's a professor, one's a doctor. That's the last time I refer to them as that. But please welcome uh, Professor Rob Wilson from Sheffield Hallam University and his sidekick, Dr. Dan Plumley, also from Sheffield Hallam University. Gentlemen, lovely to meet you. Thanks for coming in. The studio is fantastic, isn't it? Absolutely brilliant, James. Yeah, it's not bad, is it? Comfy here. chairs are meant to feel, make you feel relaxed, so there's no dangerous questions coming to you. But I'll hit you with a dangerous one to start off with. How annoying is it when it's your subject matter, when it's what you're experts at, that suddenly everyone's an expert on football business, Rob? I think one of the really interesting things about that, we've been commentating on football finance, sport finance more broadly for the last 10, 15 years. And what I've actually noticed is journalists themselves are becoming more expert in dis discussing it as a consequence of talking to people like uh, Dan and myself. But there are levels where you get quite frustrated. You know, big broadcasters putting out pretty dodgy information, actually, because they've got an ex-pro talking about something that has happened, you know, on a balance sheet or on an income statement and profit loss account or, you know, why a particular club has potentially breached financial fair play or profitability and sustainability. And what I tend to find is that a lot of people just look at the headline without really digging into the detail of what, what has actually happened. And the sort of work that Dan and I do, particularly with uh, VSI through the Sport and Directorship and CEO programme, and of course with our own research back at the university is try and shine a spotlight on what's actually going on so that it's a bit more informed there's a lot more evidence behind it and we can make some better decisions and hopefully right some of those wrongs that we hear in the press and you know pubs clubs and on terraces when we're out watching football yeah I know Dan when I speak to professional footballers they get slightly mad and infuriated by the voice of the fans you know, someone down the pub who's never played football discussing what someone's doing at Old Trafford or the Etihad Stadium. So uh, there's probably common ground with you seeing some of the headlines there and people thinking they've got the truth or they've got an understanding when they've got nothing of the sort. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've always tried, as, as Rob said, to, to keep that objectivity to it and use the, the data and the empirical evidence to drive the argument. There is a lot of misinformation out there as well from that regard, not just in the finances of clubs, but things around player wages. You know, you've got to be really careful where you take some of those figures from. And that then feeds into, you know, things that, that fans see and, and latch onto. And that then you can understand how that filters into the game. And it's unhelpful in many respects. So I, I can understand that argument as well. And, and as you started with, you know, it is everyone's now more interested in this. And, and we've been fortunate enough to carve a successful career in that. And, and it's great and everything that we do and all the research that's behind it. But you are aware of, of some of the nuances in that as well. And, and where that information comes from is really important. Is the key thing also be able to take the emotion out of it? We look at the Everton situation, which has kind of been developing over the past few weeks. Everton fans are incandescent with rage. They're shocked or all those sort of things. Um, but they're also very emotional about it. Absolutely. And and you have to, you know, something that we've always said is, you know, you have to let the numbers drive the argument. You, you can't argue with those numbers in, in the cold, hard, you know, light of day. People will. Um, there is that emotive side to it. And, and, you know, when you go back to the kind of broader principles of sport economics, we can't ignore that. There is that fan argument um, and that emotive kind of, you know, it, it's a, you can't separate that. And, and we're very aware of that, but you have to look at these things rationally as well and, and use those numbers to drive the argument and also, you know, effective decision making as well. Hopefully. Everton's become the, the, the major talking point, as I say, and a lot of in emotion kind of wound up in that. On the on Taking the emotion completely out of it then, was that a slap of the wrist or was it making a, a football club something of an example of? How, how, how did you see it? What was your take on it, Rob? But the bottom line with Everton is they've lost hundreds of millions of pounds over the last few years and... It, People will quote, continue to quote, they've only breached the regulation by about 19 and a half million quid. That's what we're being told yeah, over and over again. That's right. And, you know, some of that 19 and a half million might be wrapped up in an interest payment that perhaps should have been allowable in their deductions. But the cold facts of the case are they lost something in the order of about 360 million over that three year period. A lot of that is offset against things like stadium redevelopment, against the academy, uh, women's teams, et cetera, et cetera. So they bring down the 360 million post COVID losses, of course, that were incredibly high at Everton. And they still lost over 105 million pounds, which is the, the, the regulatory point. There is some conjecture around the, the kind of Premier League rule book. So what should the sanction be when a club breaches that sort of regulation because that's not made clear is it absolutely isn't but i think in defense of the premier league when they wrote the 
the profitability and sustainability rules, they didn't expect a club to lose 105 million quid. It's that that's massive, massive money. And you look back at Fahad Mashiri's kind of stewardship at Everton, this sustainable business plan that he that he put out in sort of 2019 that was just almost a fabrication, you know, finishing eighth every year. Um making sure that they had player sales that would meet their the player acquisitions just was never ever going to be successful or achievable so i don't think we should be surprised that they're in the position they are they've overspent they should be sanctioned accordingly we could argue whether or not it's punitive at 10 points the reality is they've lost a ton of money and uh, that's not sustainable and that's not great for the the tribalism that exists around football fandom in liverpool particularly at, at everton Dan, was, was, was your response to it, 10 points, that, that's a sting or, 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 or they've gone overboard on it? Well, I think that the challenge there and, and kind of coming back to the, the threshold as well is important in a moment. But I think the challenge, as we say, is there is no fixed formula for this to determine what an, an appropriate sanction is for the breach. And it's the first breach we've seen against the profit and sustainability regs. We can't really draw comparisons to the Portsmouth example because that was administration. It's a different case which carries um, a different penalty. So, And I think that then goes back to the fact that if we, if the Premier League are starting somewhere now, albeit it, we're 10 years into this, so it might be a late starting point, but you have to start somewhere. And then where is the proportionality in that sanction linked to the breach? And that's something that people will continue to debate because, as we've said, there is no framework. But when again, when we step away from that and, and look at regulation more generally, the threshold is quite high. Um, very high. Uh, very high in that regard. And there's then comparisons that are drawn to other regulatory frameworks. And you know, if we look at the UEFA's version, the threshold is significantly lower. And, and that's been the one that's kind of been talked about a lot down the years with the inception of financial fair play more broadly. And part of the challenge is that these clubs are trying to navigate that as well in terms of a different regulatory framework. But the threshold standard for the Premier League was very high. And I don't think, I, I think I agree with you, you know, I don't think the Premier League probably ever expected any club to really breach that to that degree. They didn't. And they didn't because of the UEFA regulation, you know, lose 30 million quid, we can just about stomach that. And there can be some owner investment. You can balance your books in a necessary way. So the again, in defence of the Premier League, they probably didn't expect anybody to breach a hundred. It was mind blowing. You could sign an elite f striker for the sort of money that they've lost over that. But isn't that period. one of the problems? The perceptions of money these days within the Premier League. But yeah. suddenly we're talking about one hundred and five million as being nothing. Yeah, and the the zeros continue to get more in number, but the core principles, which are at the at the core of the UEFA regulations, are make sure you're selling prices higher than the cost so you make a little bit of profit break even don't spend more than you earn make sure you can wash your face financially this is not rocket science um it's stuff that all of us would do on a day-to-day -day basis you know if i can't afford my mortgage the bank repossesses my house uh, it's the same for football clubs. It's, it's a very different issue I, I know from paying a mortgage but why does football suddenly cloudy those waters and make it less straightforward and less simple because it does doesn't it i think there's a Dan kind of alluded to it a minute, a, a moment or so ago. We, the most important thing in any professional sport is that you have competitive integrity and competitive balance. In order to do that, you lean on, you know, without getting academic about this discussion, uh, sport economics, which says that you need a joint nature of production. Ah, you need two teams that can come together on a field of play to create a competition. And the more equally matched those teams are, the better spectacle you have so the higher the broadcast rates you can get the higher commercial revenue more fans you can get bums on seats that type of thing and what we've seen is football in particular because it because it leads the way particularly in european sport it has this situation where everybody is striving to be better than everybody else which goes against joint nature of production because you've got a winner takes all scenario which is why we hear about you know the the sort of revenues that manchester united earn the the cases that we've got alleged at manchester city the stuff that chelsea have gone through you know just insert club name here because they're all at it um and and you find a a situation where the winner takes all scenario really stretches the balance within the competition and everybody tries to do something a little bit different to get around the rules or operate in the grey zone which then leads to further regulation and creates that ambiguity that I think we have here add in a good dose of tribalism and emotional um, involvement in a game and you can take some of the brightest business minds in the world 
stick them into a professional football club and that logic seems to go out the window. But that, it, that happens all over the place, doesn't That's not just limited to the Premier League. No, that, no. That's worldwide, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, no. And I think that the, the point there is you started with the, you know, the fan emotion side of that comes into it. The fans are a part of that because there is an expectation by the fans that clubs have to do this and clubs have to sometimes yeah. overstretch themselves to, to compete or attempt to compete when the, the realistic probability of that is actually quite low. But you are playing the game of, of overstretching. And I think we have to be aware of that in the fan narrative. And, and that's not just a dig that at Everton, as we've said, you know, that was a an unsustainable business plan. Um, but, you know, nobody was complaining about that when they won seven straight in the early part of the 2020 season and signed James Rodriguez and Carlo Ancelotti was at the helm and they were top of the league. And, you know, that again is not Everton. That's insert club name here. When things are going well, nobody pays too much attention to the finances. It's only when the gamble doesn't land that we then start to pick apart and you can see you know the club going backwards and then into real difficulty and and that has happened throughout you know English football for the course of the last 10 20 30 years or so yeah. and the insane logic that in order to be successful in football you need a wealthy owner to come in and invest loads of cash you know where have those first pr principles of business gone make sure you generate revenue and then you can spend some money you shouldn't need to rely on these handouts constantly and and I mean, that's not a, a situation that's unique to football. You could take any European sport and you will find the same issues going on. Just a few more zeros that get knocked off the off the balance sheet. One thing we don't know is whether an appeal will be successful. It sounds the way you've gone about things that, that perhaps it won't be. But does the other thing that needs to happen here, the Premier League need to kind of make things clear in terms of what the, the punishments are. Is, is that something that, that needs to develop as, as a case of this? Because we don't know. We're, everyone's sort of stabbing in the dark as, as, as to what what the rules really are, aren't they? Yeah, there's probably a bit of a metaphor about VAR in here somewhere. You know, these kind of fine margins that we look at when we're talking about an offside decision and now this the intervention of this subjective offside. It, it, the financial regulations are becoming like that. And, you know, Dan and, I, Dan and I are both analysts. We try and work within a set of rules and regulations. You know, he's a chartered management accountant that you, you have a set of govern a set of regulations that you have to adhere to and i don't think it's too much to ask that the lawmakers of the rule book the competition organizer says if you breach this regulation by x amount this will be your penalty if you go to that amount that's going to be your penalty if you breach it by i don't know another hundred million then what we're probably talking about is expulsion from the competition but make those sanctions really clear and avoid all this nonsense that we're hearing about with Everton or the you know the long drawn out process that we've got in Manchester City or you know more recent examples at Chelsea and uh, there was one um, a little while ago about the Premier League now investigating Jermaine Defoe's transfer from Spurs to Portsmouth. It's like let's just make it clear and then the clubs will know what they're doing and if they breach regulation, it's done in a calculated and systematic way and then you can punish them accordingly. What do your instincts tell you about the, the cases at City and, and Chelsea? I mean Chelsea have self reported so in the scheme of things that might stand in in their favor mightn't it could do but the, everton have done the same you know everton have been working with the premier league since march um been hit with a very very heavy sanction so i think you know the the big difference between everton and manchester city is we were talking about one single breach in i think it was 2021 um season it's taken eight months to rule against that. Manchester City have got 115 charges. You know, if we boil that down to something a bit more manageable, you're probably talking about 32 key charges in five different categories. But it goes back to 2010. It's not the sort of stuff you solve really quickly. Um, and I think there's, there's still a huge amount of water to go under the bridge in all of those cases. And part of me thinks they, they're using Everton as the test case to see what the... The backlash is going to be, and I'm sure Dan will get on in a moment to the kind of impact of the independent regulator, the government review, the King's speech that's talking. And so the Premier League are trying to say, you know what, folks, we can govern our game. Um, we haven't really bothered over the last 10 years. We've let the clubs have too much power, but we can be serious. And here's us being serious. We'll give Everton this 10 points and, and we'll see what washes out, I think, from... From there, yeah, from you're, there you're nodding your head, Dan. But what? is it them waving a flag saying we can look after things? Don't worry, no, no one else needs to help. Well, it kind of goes back to where we started with the the problem of this is that there isn't a fixed formula for the sanction that we're talking about in in the case of Everton, and that was something that was agreed in principle from day dot of the regulations, or wasn't agreed rather. So now we're kind of sort of retrospectively trying to fit an appropriate punishment and it's really tricky to do that but there is a clear way to do it there's a couple of interesting subplots then in the background that we're starting to talk about one of which of course is independent regulation 
potentially looming in English football and what that might look like and the Premier League then using Everton as a potential case to say, look, we can get our own house in order, thank you very much. And the other thing then across the landscape is what happens with those regulations moving forward irrespective of independent regulation in English football because UEFA have moved their goalposts on financial fair play and have now got financial sustainability regulations which are different to the initial setup and the Premier League have not moved yet so the Premier League did mirror to some degree UEFA's original framework like the Football League did but UEFA have moved now so what happens next and I think there is as Rob was alluding to not just the individual cases that we're focusing on and the amount of water that still needs to go under the bridge but there are other little things here that will change the landscape of of European football to come in the future and we just don't know which way they will fall but those decisions will have a really seismic impact on the industry. And I guess a bit like the, the, the players in the Manchester United dressing room who aren't receiving the hairdryer from Sir Alex Ferguson there are loads of boardrooms around the country thinking if they're looking at Everton, Chelsea, Man City they're not looking at us. Not looking at us at the moment, um, but might be looking at us in a little bit more detail as, as you know, to continue this metaphor, the water continues to flow under the bridge. And some of the big challenges you've got, both at UEFA, kind of, oh, if you go all the way up to FIFA, and, then, and certainly in the Premier League, is as the game has grown, the regulations haven't necessarily kept pace. So we mentioned a few minutes ago that 105 million quid was a big loss. Well, that's against a backdrop of a... What, 4.5 billion ish TV deal domestically, another five and a half billion internationally. You know, if those numbers go up, do you move the losses up? Do you allow different owners to come into the into the ecosystem? Uh, I'm sure we'll get onto different ownership types and investment groups and and how that might distort the whole competition. And you have to just keep pace with global change. And I think where Everton, to go back to them, have been really caught out is the COVID pandemic and the fact they tried to throw in a load of COVID adjusted losses on their transfers that they couldn't make, which was fairly spurious and a bit of nonsense, actually, if you ask me. They overstated all of that, which is why they've been caught out. But And the Premier League had to collapse their regulations over two seasons to enable the COVID adjustments to be put in place. So you have to continually keep pace with how the how the industry is moving. Uh, and I guess frustrating from an accountancy point of view that you haven't got kind of figures to kind of cross balance and cross reference with because you don't know <laughs> what they are. Oh, yeah. real time information, Dan. Talk about real time info. Yeah, but it was, it's true though, it, isn't it? it? No, you, can't, you can't go to a guidebook and say, well, it's 10 points because you've lost this money. That, that doesn't exist. Uh, absolutely. And, and that then goes back to the, the regulatory frameworks, the governance frameworks, the, the real time aspect that becomes critical to this because of course with the Everton case as well, we're talking about a sanction that was applied the, the the season that we're talking about but that sanction should should have and could have probably been applied two or three years prior to that and and real-time information and, and financial reporting is still a big challenge in the industry a lot of that is to do with resource as well so there's a you know resource envelope that the the leagues themselves are working with but it does make these things then you know really really critical in in the narrative because it has to be done in real time as, as best it can be it has to be done consistently it has to be done properly in in a regulatory framework um and and there are lots of things that will continue to push up against that framework and and owners is one of those the broadcasting landscape is one of those the you know the the wage control is one of those there are lots of other moving parts to this and and i'm not saying it's an easy challenge to solve but but there are clearly things that you know, can be put in place to, to make this better. And I think that's what ultimately we're all striving for. Are you also both astonished that people are talking about these things 10 years, 15 years down the line of your academia, that, you know, you were you were pioneering it back then, but now suddenly it's, it's out there for everyone to talk about? I mean, I, I remember delivering a, a, a paper at a conference in 2012 in Denmark, that, and, and the title Lord of that Treesman. paper was, yeah. was What Next for Financial Fair Play? And, and that's what we presented on. And you know, here we are now talking about it, as you say, 10 years on. Um, I thought we were getting chased out of the room that day because the, the, the finishing line of the presentation was, you know, these regulations are all well and good, but where there's money to be made, people will break the rules. And a couple of guys from UEFA in there weren't overly happy with, you know, big new regulatory process. And these two jumped up academics at a, at a business school in the United Kingdom are saying, well, if there's money to be made, people are going to break the rules or find a way around them. Actually, I think we've been proven right in that. And these, these systematic cases that we hear about s subsequently have, have proved that. Not that, I, not that we ever did it to say I told you so. No, no, it was, it was 
the data that was driving the story, wasn't it? But you know, we, the title of that was "Where Next for FFP," and and we could probably ask the same question right I was now. Say, you Ten could, years we, we on, we're probably paper, talking about you, that yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, it it it's been a fascinating space to be involved in, but you know that there are challenges within the system that we've seen over the years for sure one of the things you do on a, on a yearly basis is an investable guide to clubs throughout the country so mm. throughout the uk 114 clubs i think it is uh, i had a look through last year's it seemed that the least sexy the club was the better it was perhaps to invest in it and th therein lies the rub doesn't it because people want sexiness they don't want maybe investability i don't I'm, yeah that i love that phrase investability we kind of I think we almost cooked it up with a... Um, I was trying to work out actually if it is a word. It's not a word. I'm, no, we're going to try yeah, and get it in the Oxford the, English Dictionary. I couldn't work where, where the vowels went and everything like yeah. that. So we, so we cooked it up with um, a guy called Josh Davey who works for a big marketing agency, a really, really smart kid. And we wanted to do something different to all this kind of valuation data that you get, whether it's a Forbes list or you can look at Tom, Tom Markham's multivariate model if you want to get really scientific about it or some of the other... Uh, valuation techniques um, and a lot of people were starting to talk about revenue multiples which we just don't think are relevant in in a professional sport environment certainly in football um, so we started to really examine what is it that drives a valuation in a football club and you go way beyond infrastructure playing staff academy you go into things like digital footprints so your kind of global reach um, you go into sort of stadium infrastructure utilization how you can really connect with a broader fan base how you can monetize fans that might not reside engage in them. them then monetize them exactly yeah. yeah and 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 critically let's move the point of reference from 50 60 70 thousand people going to watch their team on a saturday the two percent of your global following and start looking at the 98 percent because that's where the revenue upside is that's where the growth is so the investability index in inverted commas or invest in soccer as it will hopefully be called uh, come the new year enables a prospective owner to mess around with the weighting so if you're really keen on you're an ipswich fan aren't you so if you think right i want to buy ipswich i think the valuation is going to be about four million um but what i'd really like to know is where are my revenue upsides can i get more fans through the gate can i get more sales of of merchandise in i don't know brazil somewhere in south america because that's where there's a hot spot on the digital footprint you can start up weighting that as a criteria for your club selection and hopefully it should come out for you as a as a fan yeah, of the club. I but, think the owners there are trying to just pin getting into the Premier League like everyone else is. Yeah, and so so you start to move what those objectives might be. Now, when you look at the investability index, what you find is that because we've equalized the weightings for the purpose of the website, is some of those less sexy clubs. I was really pleased because I'm from Cheltenham and Cheltenham Town was like fifth. Yeah, you were high up, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's because it's a club that is ripe for investment and has a big upside in either getting more people through the gate, adding a bit of value to playing squad. So you can start to extract value as an owner. Of course, it takes the assumption that you want to be a profit maximizer and you want to generate a return on your investment, which ultimately I think a lot of club owners are starting to do. Yeah, our growth were number one last year. Yeah, um, and, and we're, for the last three or four years, we're yeah. kind of hovering in the top three. So it's one of those where, again, it, you know, it's you a nice put in, part of the world. Absolutely. And you put in the proposition forward and, and saying, you know, this is what the data is showing us. The crucial thing, as you say, is whether or not you choose to invest in that is the individual person's decision. Uh, and also what we've been able to do with that is to, to, put bandings on valuations rather than an, an exact yeah. valuation, which again, it goes back to the, the methodology and, and the investment decision is if you have got naught to 5 million to invest, these are the types of clubs you should be looking at where the value proposition is. If you've got five to 10 million, these are the types of value ranges. If you've got four, five, six billion, then you should be looking yeah, right at the top end. And, and there are a couple of clubs that, that might take your eye. Um, but it, it's, it's done in a way that, as we say, try to fit the individual motives around it as well. And, and we're assuming there that, you know, people see some of the things we were talking about earlier that perhaps doesn't happen in the industry. Plans for incremental growth, plans for legitimate, sustainable models in the future, plans to realise some of that investment back in the long term. And, and that should be the strategy. And, and that's what the whole you know piece is designed around as well in many ways. And also there's no need to be a fit and proper person because you can just get in whatever you do, can't you? <laughs> well, they're tightening those regulations up. They, and they say keep, they are. They, yeah, they keep <laughs> doing that. Well, do you know what I found really interesting with that investability index and you know come back to the, the whole VSI environment is I've been working with 
with Tony and Andy and the team for the last five or six years. So you are continually uh, building relationships with sporting directors or, or trainee CEOs, all of whom have got a knowledge of the industry that they're working in. So take our growth or Falkirk or Ross County. When you're rubbing shoulders with delegates that come from that part of the world or have got a, a, a background or some experience in those clubs, you can start to really triangulate your assumptions as an analyst um, and work out where things are going. So actually, the, the, the delegates on the program inadvertently have fed into some of those, mm -hmm. some of those findings, some of those weightings, and I think it makes it really interesting. Then, if you're looking for your next post, you can have a look at investability and say, actually, yeah, that club looks like it's on the up. That might be a really good place to work. I think as well there, James, you touch on a really important point, and it's a, it's a separate piece of work to the investability stuff, but something that we've worked on recently um, and again without getting too academic but kind of a 30-year financial overview of English football one thing that we've we've really hit home on on that is that actually sometimes governance is not the problem the frameworks are there it's the actors in the system that push up against that framework and your point there around fit and proper ownership is is exactly that case in point while ever that system is in place you will always get actors that will push up against the regulatory framework um, so that's a really important point that we should be Because it seems to me, and I'm not just limiting this to Ipswich, it's going fantastically well. I'm delighted. I'm proud to be an Ipswich fan for the first time in about 20 years. But the dream seems to be, and the business plan, get to the Premier League and then we'll pay our bills. Yeah, and that's the danger, isn't it? That's the, the big gamble, you know, without, you know, putting money on a roulette table. That's essentially what some clubs have been doing. And that's what the regulations are designed to try and make you avoid doing you overstretch you then you almost bankrupt yourself financially and if you think all the way back to it was like 2003 4 i was still just kind of coming out of my masters you probably were still at school dan um but leeds united that was a compliment yeah. it was a compliment yeah, yeah. I, I took it as one yeah i would yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but leeds united put a business plan together that basically said we need to finish well our, our budget over the next three years is based on us finishing third in the premier league and reaching the latter stages of the Champions League. You know, nobody in their right mind from a business perspective would put that into a business plan because it's uncontrollable. You know, top 10 maybe, qualification for Champions League maybe, or European competition. And, and, and that's where Dan's point on actors is really, really important because it's the actor, the owner, the board that are making some pretty crazy decisions trying to reach the top doing that winner-takes-all scenario thing and just getting wrapped up in that that emotion, that tribalism, and just sometimes I think need to take a step back and look at it objectively. But we've been be told boring. time and time again that <laughs> loopholes are being closed and, and they don't seem to be closed. Well, well, unfortunately, I think there in that case as well, history tends to repeat itself in football because that Leeds United case, and, and just going back to Everton for a moment, that sustainable business plan that was based on a top eight finish, we now know but you know 20 years down the line that a top eight finish in the premier league is difficult you know the the top six is probably mm. off limits you're probably now looking at a top seven so being best of the rest is not easy and and if models are based on that and, and again to go back to the top end of the championship when expectations start to rise that's when the pressure is to then go for the gamble and there's a lot of clubs that have been in that position and a lot of clubs that have rolled the dice and that's all okay while that's still in play. And if it lands, fantastic. You know, we could talk about numerous cases. Again, the, the Wolverhampton Wanderers a few years ago breached financial fair play spent, and, and yeah. settled out of court with UEFA um, because they got promoted from the championship and then went straight into the Europa League because they had such a good first season. But had they have not got out of the championship they would have fell foul of, of the English Football League's profit and sustainability yeah. regulations. They, they'd blown that apart. Add Leicester City, add Bournemouth. Uh, yeah, insert, so insert so club name. And, and yeah. the gamble's okay if it lands. Um, when it doesn't, it can unravel. And I think, again, the point about Leeds United, we are talking about similar cases 20 years on, just, just mm. a few more zeros on the end of the, the pound sign. I, I want to talk about ownership models because that, that's interesting. And I think all of us at our hearts would love to see all our clubs owned by fans. It's happened at Portsmouth, there's a little bit at Exeter City and there's a couple of other clubs as well, but it hasn't been the panacea because um, everyone thinks they know how to do it because they love their club and that's probably the worst thing that could ever happen, isn't it? Yeah, it's the opposite end of the continuum, isn't it? So you could have one dictator that's running the whole thing through their, their ownership the group. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can have that one person making all the decisions which makes it really risky because they might be making the wrong ones. By the same token, you put a fan ownership group in, you can have... 
umpteen different members. Barcelona, a great example of, of a club that has completely destroyed its eating itself, hasn't it, through bad financial decisions. And we, we Dan and I wrote a paper, I think it was your first one actually, 23rd, 2013, did something on ownership structure, the impact of ownership structure on financial performance and the correlation between the two. And at the time, Manchester United were coming out at kind of 1.5, 1.5. They were really good on the field of play and they were really good financially. And everybody else was in that, I remember it now, it was in that bottom quartile where you don't want to be. So financially, not very good. Sporting context, not very good. And so many clubs are in that boat because there is no real single ownership model that works. You would probably argue that a stock market flotation is the best, most effective, because you're accountable to people that are trying to make money. Um, so you can't make those irrational decisions that we see many, many club owners making. And as well, in the modern day game, as we're talking, the the notion of fan ownership is, is there are some merits to that. We're all in agreement with that, but it has a ceiling in the modern day game. Right. And that ceiling is probably, with the way the composition of the leagues are at the minute and the finances and the gap, that that ceiling is probably sort of mid-table league one that's the yeah. difficulty isn't it and that's as high as you're going to get if yeah. with under a fan ownership yeah. model because you have a look at some of the clubs that you know are relegated into league one at various occasions some quite big clubs with quite powerful ownership structures in that mm. particular division at that time how do you compete with those from a fan ownership point of view because you can't finance you can't finance it you can't raise that amount of money and investment through a fan group traditionally speaking to be able to to break that hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And if you are gonna go down that route, then you have to be aware that there's a, there's a realistic ceiling. And we saw it with, it was Swansea City, again, yeah, yeah. A, a number of years ago, wasn't it? Where the ownership, the fan ownership group actually came out and said, we can't take this any further because to take it further needs significant amount of investment. Yeah, the, the foot, we hear about the football pyramid a lot, don't we? There's a reason there's a point at the top of the pyramid because somebody will always be the biggest and the best. What we don't want as fans, and this is what goes against the joint nature of production, what we don't want as fans is not to be competitive. So, you know, you could point to Simon Hallett and the job he's doing at Plymouth Argyle, outstanding. Andy Holt, Accrington Stanley, outstanding. The, the guys at Lincoln City, Clive Nates and uh, Liam Scully, who's CEO there, absolutely brilliant. They're financially sustainable. They're incrementally progressing. So they're sitting in mid-table League One or League Two, they're not challenging necessarily for titles, although you know Plymouth did pretty well last year. Fans don't always want that slow incremental progression. They want the 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 fast flowing football on that Saturday afternoon, that where they can go back and say, "Yeah, we've got plus three. We're going to go up this year." So there's almost this clamour for entertainment that drives the overspending. And when you get an owner that's actually a bit more objective and trying to do things the right way, they perhaps don't get the the credit that they deserve. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're back then to some of the perennial problems aren't we the, the expectation then becomes the narrative and if you start to have a particularly good season that starts to maybe exceed the board's expectations even at some of those really well-run clubs and, and the ones that are trying to do the right thing the pressure then comes okay so when are we having a go at the playoffs when are we when are we having that push um and it and it rubs up against all those principles of sustainable business models because you then back to a situation of do we roll the dice or do we not so to extend your pyramid metaphor and talk mm. about the, the very tip is that the best ownership model because they are the best and talking about manchester city and, and a sovereign state yeah what a question that is james um i'm glad you're taking that one first i think you've got some thinking time yeah the the need right let's go okay i think the best models of ownership are ones that are self-sufficient so dan and i will always talk when we're teaching or where we're when we're commentating uh when we're writing for um for a newspaper or for, for a website we will always talk about the importance of earned versus unearned income so earned income is all the stuff that you are in total control of as a product of your um sporting performance so manchester united when they signed that very first deal with uh, Nike for the shirt manufacturing and then supplemented it with the Adidas deal at 75 million quid for license. That was off the back of sporting success that had been earned by that team. If you then compare that to a sovereign wealth fund or you compare that to a state ownership model, 
I think what we see is a, an, a, an increasing proportion of what I'd say is unearned income. That, so that's income that's derived as a direct result of the ownership of the football club. So Etihad sponsorship of Manchester City. And I'll just, a few people have heard me talk about this before, but I'll do it anyway. So when Manchester City signed the first deal with Etihad, it was worth about 40 million over, uh, I think, sorry, it was about 400 million over a 10 year period. So 40 million a year. Shirt sponsorship, stadium naming rights. When they signed that deal, they'd never qualified for the Champions League. They'd never won the Premier League title. In the same period, Arsenal, who had qualified for the Champions League on 10 consecutive years, had got through the latter stage of the Champions League, I think in eight of those 10 years, and who had won the Premier League in that 10-year period, signed a similar deal with Emirates for 20 million quid a year, 200 million over 10. So that's where this earned versus unearned debate comes in. Now, if you've got access to that cash, great. Uh, and it was unregulated, potentially. There's loads and loads of alleged cases at Man City at the moment. But they've built their empire on what I'd consider to be unearned income. And now they're supplementing it with earned income as a product of their sporting performance, which is great to see. The, but the counter argument there. is that, that if they went from a standing start and they've got to get up to Absolutely. Yeah. But which is what, which is, so I'll come back to incremental progression. So if you're doing it incrementally, you will eventually get to that point, but it might have taken them 30 years to do so. But, but I was staggered also in your research in the investability index, if you want to call it that, the amount of infrastructure that they've paid for oh, huge. at the Etihad campus. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's, that's game changing in itself, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. And, when, and so when you put the whole Manchester City package together, you are talking about much more than 11 guys running around on a football pitch on a on a Saturday you're talking about complete regeneration of the east side of Manchester you're talking about uh, progressions in academy structures you're talking about progression in sports science in nutrition in scouting in the development of data all of this infrastructure stuff that probably wouldn't have existed unless a, a disruptive force like a state ownership model come into a particular football club so you need to be really careful on the narrative if you want to come back to rule book and the principles that govern the game, I think there are questions, which is why we've got these alleged cases. But if you look at the Man City story, I think it's really difficult for anybody to really criticise. Because let's go back to joint nature of production. Someone needed to knock Manchester United off the perch because it was becoming, as a Manchester United fan, I hasten to add, a little bit boring watching them win over and over and over again and comfortably. I think that notion of he's a Sheffield I Wednesday. Fan. I know that was a big I sign. Knew that a big was coming. <laughs> yeah, knew that was coming. Um, most people. There, there's an interesting aware ownership model. There's a very interesting ownership model. That's probably a podcast in its own right. So let's not um, go down that road. Maybe today. I, I think the best model of ownership. We have to view that through a best fit lens, dependent on the ecosystem at the time. And Rob's alluded to Manchester City there as an example. We could go further back. Uh, and look at the Abramovich takeover of mm. Chelsea at a time when there were no regulation. Because the other thing, of course, going back to regulation is the counter argument to that and the other end of the extreme is you take all the regulations away and it's open season again. And nobody quite wants to go down that road. But that was a position we were in, in the Premier League and English football, when some of these now super powerful ownership groups came into play. Some have come in since that time. And obviously the next biggest one on the list linked to that is the Newcastle as a more recent example. But they, the way in which that's positioned becomes then that kind of best fit approach for the time of the takeover and going back to some of the principles of what does that ownership group want to achieve? And that's where you have to overlay the motives of the example at Manchester City was obviously much bigger than Manchester City and look at the City Football Group and it was always much bigger than, than City. But that club has seen an awful lot of success off the back of that, which I'm sure the fans are obviously delighted about. There are other motives where it's about the, the owner and a vanity project and, and that can hurt the club in, in a detrimental way. So it's I, I don't think there's a direct answer to your question, but there's a lot of evidence out there that says actually, you know, the it, depends on other things in the ecosystem as well. And it becomes then a case of the best fit for that club at the particular point in time. But all of that is pushing up against ultimately a governance framework that they have to conform to. But I imagine also it's no coincidence that Newcastle's owners are going about it slightly differently. We're not seeing the, the equivalent of Rubinho rocking well, up in a and white they can't Lamborghini. Do that. And they can't do that because of the regulations. Which is why we needed a regulatory process, I think, in the first place. Because there was a time when 
Abramovich was at Chelsea and he could pretty much have said, right, I'm not interested in doing this anymore. I'm leaving tomorrow. I don't want any of the money that I've invested back. You could just keep it. They'd have gone bankrupt within a week because their wages to turnover ratio was like 198%. So they're spending twice their revenue on play wages. Um, we needed to move away from that system because that's when a club goes into oblivion and you end up with a with a Berry example or a Macclesfield or, you know, there are countless examples of this. So we needed, there, there needed to be an intervention to stop it. I think what has happened as a consequence of regulation is clubs have been much more innovative and creative about the way they've gone about their typical business. And like any regulation or governance system, we now need to start closing some of those loopholes because, you know, anybody wants to work in the grey zone because that's how you generate competitive advantage, whether, you know, I used to swim. Um, so so when you started weight training, you know, half, half of the swimmers in the club weren't weight training, the other half were. The ones that were weight training all of a sudden got really, really quick. Now, weight training is a product of being a professional swimmer. Um, you operate in different zones, you become innovative, and then it's about the competition organiser to regulate about what they think is fair or unfair. Hence, we get a, a long time lag be before we ever change anything. And the interesting thing about Newcastle, to pivot that from ownership to finance and back again, is actually they haven't been able to open the checkbook mm. because of... Uh, the regulations, but they have been able to spend and grow because their previous owner, despite the, <laughs> what the fans thought about Mike Ashley, left them in a pretty good financial position to be able to invest and do but that. Arguably the most financially sustainable owner the Premier League's ever seen and got absolutely hammered by Newcastle United fans. But he was seriously, seriously objective and business focused with that football club. Mm. And because the fans weren't happy with the lack of investment and so on and so forth, it's the platform that he created that's enabled the new Saudi group to go in and actually do some things that they perhaps wouldn't have been able to do under the FFPR regulations. Which brings us on to the, the maximum or the, or, the, or the biggest profit maximizers in the world. Uh, take off your fan hat, if you will. Uh, yeah. The Glazer family of, of Stretford and Trafford. Yeah, so I've up until very recently not been overly critical of the ownership structure. Um, because they have run Manchester United as a profit-making entity. And as, again, come back to it, I'm an analyst, I look at this stuff. You want to see profit at the bottom of that P&L rather than a loss, because it's much more sustainable. I think what we've seen with the Glazers is they've invested heavily in playing squad, but the off-field activities, the the lack of real sporting departments, whether it's a sporting director or a director of football, whatever we want to call it, they've been so slow to catch up with the innovators in the field that we've started now to shine a spotlight on what they've really been up to and you know concrete falling off the roof at Old Trafford the leaky roof all of that infrastructure that they should have been investing in hasn't but hasn't isn't that the staggering thing because this is the one thing that's frustrated me and I'm not a Manchester United fan clearly but I spent a lot of time in, in that mm. kind of end of town talking about their problems that in business if you're not good at something you get in someone who is good at it and, yeah. and, and, and you ride on their coattails yeah. and they do the job for you and yet they've never done that at Manchester United. They, they talk about it a lot, but the jobs they're offering aren't the jobs that then they're, they're giving people either. Yeah, no, and, and that has been, you know, one of the, the fair criticisms that I think has been, you know, levelled at that ownership group. And, and then you start to overlay some of the things we're talking about, you know, what is the overall motive and desire and, and what, what is the end game and the exit point? And I think that's where there are lots of colliding factors there within it. And it, despite all... and despite all of that that we're talking about and the on-pitch on pitch success that hasn't followed the Sir Alex Ferguson era, that club, irrespective of all those things, has still been able to generate yeah. decent-ish commercial but They have, deals. But, but I was talking to a guy at The Athletic about this the other week. What would those values have been had yeah, they maintained if, the sport? In, so yeah. Snapdragon across the front of the shirt, 80 million quid, should have been 120, yeah. right? People don't ask those questions because they just say 80 million or it's the biggest shirt sponsorship deal we've signed in in the EPR history. I think this comes back to emotion. I think the, the, the team at Manchester United off the field have been playing football manager. I think they've been thinking, yeah, Alexis Sanchez, what a great signing that would be without any real consideration of how that player fits into the team, the structure, the philosophy, all the stuff they do at Manchester City, I hasten to and, add. Yeah, and, 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 and also Manchester City saying, oh, we might sign him as well. Yeah. So we're going to do that. Yeah, uh, so in, the, in the same, same way with Ronaldo. Ronaldo. Yeah. Ronaldo yeah. And so, so I think all of that has been unravelled. And 
you know, they, they have had to open the books for, for investment, strategic investment, as they called it, because they simply don't have liquidity in the organization to do the things that the infrastructure or the team or the sporting side need to compete with. Well, they're with. doing transfer deals where they're paying over installments over years, yeah. you know, uh, and they've got a, a big chunk of cash there, which is which is al- already not paid for stuff that they've said they've paid for. Yeah, which is not untypical. No, it's but it's just, not but, Manchester United, though, is it? Correct. Yeah, that's the thing. You go back to when uh, Real, Real Madrid signed Ronaldo from them. You know, it's an 80 million flat fee payment, 1st of June. It's in the account. And, and of course, because the numbers are getting bigger everywhere, you start to see a splitting of transfer payments, which every club is doing in the in the league. Manchester United have just racked up a three hundred and forty-ish million quid's worth of transfer debt. I think it stands. But, but what, what, again, what frustrates me is I'm, I'm no fan of the Glazers because I would rather see kind of British ownership. Um, but they've given money to spend; it's just been spent appallingly well, everywhere. I think, I think that goes back to your point, doesn't it? And, and I, Rob, I completely agree with the take on those some of those deals were very good but could have been better and could have been maximized and and then you go back to the strategic direction of the organization and and how often have we talked about it needing to be a top-down approach from ownership that filters through and and you have to question then you know if it could have been 120 million for that deal versus 80 what what's the glazers take we'll never know the answer but what is the glazers take on that what, what is the narrative then to try and extract value from that how does that filter down to the people that are doing that job you know in the boardroom and otherwise well they, they reckon they want i think the pitch deck that they put put out with the strategic investment with the rain group said they expect to be a billion pound revenue business by 2027 now that's a leap big right there's yeah, six, but it's, it's a big leap though isn't six 70 ish million i think at the moment uh, Man City of seven fourteen, whatever it was. So they might beat them anyway. Add in a hundred million, you'd say get somebody like Neil Joyce in from the CLV group. He could probably add a hundred million to your bottom line through some extension on this kind of fan engagement piece, this fourth pillar of revenue that we that we mentioned earlier. Getting from seven hundred and fifty to a billion Big. is mega against the backdrop of you know what one Champions League qualification in the last two or three years, a, Car- a Carabao Cup victory very indifferent start to the season this year despite the fact that I actually think the manager is probably going to do a really good job um, and the other thing with the strategic investment is if that works the value of the organization just gets bigger doesn't it but you make the point in one of your studies that if they engage their fans in the proper way and they've got a billion fans worldwide mm. so so they say each of those pays a quid so a quid you've, each, you've done your billion you've haven't done you? it yeah. but they're not doing it no, no club's really doing it um, and how, how do you do that then so that's or, or, about or, shifting your focus from the, in United's case, 73,000 fans paying to go in through the gate. And, and we've heard a lot about this kind of sport tourism angle. So lots of people coming in from different parts of the world. You've almost got to just say, that, look, we accept them. They're going to come in. Um, our fans on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whenever it is they're coming in, they're going to come in, right? Man, Man United should sell out. How do you engage a fan in Tokyo? They might not have enough money to fly over to consume a Premier League game. What content can you sell that fan? So how do you drive your app? Like they do in the UFC on a UFC fan pass. So you charge them a fiver a month and it gives them behind the scenes access to what's going on at Carrington. A training plan for one of the players. Bruno Fernandez's Spotify playlist. How do you generate... That'd be very angry, I think. It might be. <laughs> how, but how do you generate that? How can you generate that engagement? And if you can generate that engagement, then you can monetize it. And a billion, just over a billion followers, they claim to have a pound each for an app. You know, So, so Jim needs money. to listen to this podcast to find out how he does it when he comes into the football club. Well, yeah, I think I think Neil at CLV is probably talking... It should be talking to them already. Um, but absolutely. And I think that's... The interesting thing about Jim Ratcliffe is, as a Manchester United fan and the age he is, you know, he doesn't seem to be driven by this kind of profit that we've seen with with the Glazers. That will all unravel, you know, as and when the, the investment comes in. But absolutely, if they want to grow the brand, that's the sort of but stuff. But is, the, is the other danger, having looked at the books, suddenly gets in and realises, bugger, I've, I've been sold an absolute kipper here. Yeah, well, he's diluted... The Glazer shares, he paid very, very handsomely for them. I think they've ended up $33 a share, something like that. And the, the trading point is kind of averages about $20. So it's diluted the Glazer stake to about 52%, which is why the numbers get a little bit confusing because he's still floated a lot on the stock exchange. But over time, if their revenues increase and if their sporting performance improves, he would hope to realize the $33 a share. And if he wants to buy any more, 
they're also going to be more expensive. So the value of the organisation also goes but, but up. But down within that, they've got to repair, replace, retire Old Trafford and make Carrington a, a Premier League training ground rather than League One. Yeah, well, there's the cost side to that again, isn't it? That's the other side of the equation. The revenue side is one thing, the cost side is the other. So going into that with your eyes open, you should be aware of that level of investment. And then you can start to not just look at the price tag, but the cost of the acquisition overall and, and some of the things you've got to do. And also, even when we consider the revenue side of that equation, we have to go back to that principle of control and, and earned versus unearned, because all those things that you've just spoke about, Rob, are in, are in control of the club. They've not been doing it and other clubs haven't found a way to do that yet, but they could. The other thing that's not in their control is the unearned side of that, which is where the power dynamics come in because some of the things they want to get control of. And if we look at TV deals for a minute, you know, talk about those subscription services to fans. What if those clubs, and this is some of the things that they're pushing for, what if those clubs can find a way to sell a number of matches direct on their own broadcasting platforms per season? Mm. We saw the Manchester United v Liverpool game in Thailand, I think it was in the summer. Um, yeah the two clubs sold that on their own platforms now you can't do that in the Premier League at the minute under the broadcast regulations Scottish football have done that there is a, a point in the Scottish football deal whereby clubs can sell I think it's five games a season on their own platforms through their own services the challenge with that is that Celtic and Rangers will benefit most from that so we're back to the same argument of are we there for the winner takes all and, and vested interest or the collective good of the league but Overlay that with Manchester United and the Champions League reforms, um, a potential Super League that will never be off the table. And then you start to look at the potential to grow that revenue line and the value. And some of it will be earned and in control of. But other things at the minute are out of scope because the club can't control it. We could do United for another two hours. and We're going to draw Quite a line easily. there. Yeah. Um, bearing in mind, I think you're hankering after the boredom that you've uh, experienced pre-Manchester City's rise. You'd, you'd love that again, wouldn't you? Yes, I would. <laughs> yeah. Um, the fourth pillar or the fourth kind of ownership model is, is private equity. And we've seen that come in mm -hmm. uh, at Burnley most recently. Is that Are we going to see more of that, do you think, in, in the future? Is, is, is that the model that, that might come up the rails? Yeah. The, so we've talked a lot today, haven't we, about risk, really. So the risk of uh, generating revenue, the risk of regulation, the risk of different types of ownership models coming into the game. The, the, the upside of all that regulatory practice is it de-risks the Premier League. So the likelihood of a Chelsea, a Manchester United, a Tottenham Hotspur, a Manchester City being relegated, notwithstanding charges, is very, very remote. So to a private investor, particularly private equity, all of a sudden the Premier League looks like a good investment much like it does in the States where you've got these closed league systems and you can invest in franchise, which also then grows almost exponentially the value of that particular um, particular asset. So I think uh, we've started to see it already, but we will increasingly see more and more private equity come into the game, whether that's through partial stakes or whether it's full acquisition. It will be heavily, heavily invested on day one, which is what we've seen at Chelsea. The money will then stop over a five-year period and then we'll look to exit. If you speak to any private equity house, they would normally be on a five to six-year time horizon. We need to extend that to 10 to 12, I think, for for football because you need a bit more longevity. But I'm saying thank goodness as an Ipswich fan, then, yeah, 10 to 12 but, years. I'll but do. absolutely. And, and do you know the real benefit of it? It's got, there were a lot of criticisms of private equity. One of the real benefits is it focuses on the bottom line and making sure the club will run financially sustainable because that's in their best interest to generate an additional sale price when they look to exit. So whoever comes next yeah. is inheriting something that's in pretty good working order, is what you're saying, yeah. or, much, should, or should yeah. be. goes back to... Uh, Ashley pretty much did it at Newcastle. You know, get the, get the house in order, get the business making some money, and then sell it. And as it was for him, you know, he kind of put in 380 million and he got 380 million, so he got his money back. Probably one of the first owners in football that actually got their money back after a a fairly extended stint. Back when you were being run out of that talk in 2012, I guess people were probably saying then as well that the Premier League, the bubble will burst in football. We're sat here in 2023 and the bubble hasn't burst. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger with no sign of burst. That's fair, isn't it, Dan? Uh, absolutely. And, and going back to the private equity conversation, they, those kind of firms see growth in the market mm -hmm. and, and they are still seeing untapped potential. You know, we're talking about the domestic broadcasting deal has, has flatlined a little bit, but the, the overseas rights have gone above that and have outstripped it for the first time. 
in recent years and there is still growth in the international market. There's growth in America that, that clubs and, and leagues are targeting. That There's growth all the way around the world. And again, private equity firms and, and the way they operate see the potential in that. And, and despite the fact that we keep talking about the bubble might burst at some point, as you quite rightly say, it hasn't. And one of the advantages still then within that is that football is still a relatively cheap asset class for private equity. Oh, big time. Um, How many times have you been asked that question though? When, oh, when will football's bubble about to be burst? Yeah. We've written on it about yeah. three or four times, I think. And oh, it's keeping yeah. him in business though. Yeah, good. It, and yeah. It, it just never does. No, never does. There's always something else. And when we talk about revenue generation, there's always something else. So they're talking about um, regulations around gambling sponsorship, aren't they, at the moment? So outlaw in that a big up, up cry in the... Uh, in the football league because so many clubs are, are sponsored by a betting partner the reality is betting replaced alcohol which replaced uh, cigarettes cigarettes and yeah. tobacco something else will come along uh, well something else has come along it? because we're talking about nfts and cryptocurrencies yeah. Yeah. something will come after them yeah. there is always something else yeah. which comes to the very heart of this entire discussion which i think is around the that emotional drive that everybody every key stakeholder in the game yeah. is seduced by the competition aren't they well we've used that term haven't we in football you could insert football but you know the term of sport is recession proof in, in many so. ways and football is has you know proven that throughout the years so how interesting is it that we're on a global scale in one corner you've got leo messi perhaps the greatest player in the world pinning his colors to the mls mask very expensively mm. in the other corner cristiano ronaldo perhaps the best player in the world definitely pinning his colors to a very expensive mask in saudi arabia but, do either of those go in the right direction? I, I, I bearing in mind the MLS and American football, or football in America, has a World Cup in 2026. Is that the safer bet as a, as, a, as a kind of financial model, or is it because the resources are endless in Saudi Arabia? That's going to go in the right way because we, you know, you'll, you'll be sick of people saying, "Well, it's China all over again." Yeah, the, the, I mean, Saudi Pro League does feel a bit like a Chinese Super League at the moment. The, the resources appear to be more limitless. What you've got to remember in the Chinese Super League is we had the kind of the political environment around we would like to host a World Cup, we want to be competitive. COVID really had a big impact on them, but they were building schools for, you know, developing playing talent. They were buying coaches, buying stakes of players. We'd not necessarily seen that in the same way with Saudi. The American market is much more mature and much more geared around profit maximization. So the last, I think it was pretty much the last franchise, 31st, 32nd, MLS franchise sold for about five hundred and fifty million dollars, which is you know pretty significant chunk of change. The the problem we've got in Saudi is it's very emergent, and you've got a full continuum of playing talent. Haven't you? You've got kind of part time local talent that that don't really know what they're alongside doing. Alongside Karim Benzema, alongside and Benzema, Neymar, Ronaldo, and you know my son, he's sixteen, he still follows it. It's like Ronaldo's going to score the most goals across the calendar year. It's like, well, he's got a fair chance of that. Hasn't so he's, he? he's got a disowned membership, has he? he yeah, one of, the, one, of the, one of the very few. One of the very few. Um, but he'll watch them on, you know, on TikTok and on YouTube Reels and all that stuff to to watch Ronaldo's goals. And they're brilliant, by the way, right? He's scoring some amazing goals. It's because the people around him can't walk, because the let alone run. Exactly. And I think that's the biggest limiting factor at the moment with the Saudi Pro League, notwithstanding the climate, because it's going to slow the game down, as we the, saw in the The other point you made in your study was about the Champions League and, 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 and the kind of transit of players where people want to stay and play in the, the competition yeah. rather than max out and go to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, which we saw, it goes back, decades doesn't it when I mean when Pele went to the MLS when David Beckham went to the MLS they tend to go towards the end of the career for the there's a big paycheck but there's also a positive bounce they can have on participation and, and, and generation of the league but we'll keep coming back to to Europe for some time yeah I think yeah and, and I think that's why the Saudi project has to become long term because of some of those factors because it's emerging and because it, it has to sustain a period of time now where it it looks to do all of those things and, and I think we might see some of what we saw in China we might see you know a bigger play on homegrown talent to counter some of the things that we're talking about the the financial power is there I think the the thing that derailed China more so than anything was the political narrative changed I don't think we'll see that with Saudi and of course you know we're looking at you mentioned the 2026 World Cup where's the 2030 World Cup going and and they've got a vision 2030 for their kingdom yeah. that that all this is you know framed around everything's as well. leading towards the vision for 2030 yeah, so, and, yeah and not just football as well we've no. seen other sporting events you know even the WWE are over in Saudi Arabia now for pay-per-view events it's it's much bigger again than than football and and I think that's where we might see some difference to China in the long run 
but as we're talking now, you know, we still there are still some unanswered questions there, and and because it's emerging, it, it will need that sustained growth over a longer period and the to average, get close. And the average crowds are six and a half thousand. And the, and I think they are aware of that as well. You know, we did a piece recently where they're they're talking about aspirations of being in the top ten. It, top it's a ten revenue, leagues in the world. Yeah, and yeah. That, and that's based on a revenue generating position yeah. of the clubs. So that is still a long way off. I think they're. 20th or 21st on the list at the minute you can make up some ground in that 10 to 20 quite quickly because a lot of the other leagues in the world are quite close together and, and are not on the scale of the premier league or the big five the challenge will be can you get to the top 10 can you sustain that and even within all of that with the way the market is can you ever break into that top five and that'll be dependent on the champions league the premier league where that goes, the other leagues in Europe, because European football still has the stranglehold in the market. Well, that's that's the staggering thing, isn't it? You know, we talk about being almost a billion pounds worth of expenditure in the, in the summer to transform the Saudi Pro League, and yet the Premier League look at that and think we can spend far more than that. And we did biggest biggest broadcast deal in world football. Um, I think it's probably the third biggest in world sport certainly behind the nfl because that's a few billion quid more we forget about american sports when we talk about yeah, yes fair point. european football yeah, fair point. Um, is, is that just numbers a lot of that you know yeah, it's just, the, the economy of scale in terms of Amer american sport and making money yeah pretty you know, much dallas cowboys versus yeah. manchester united or manchester city for example yeah and they're those kind of global iconic brands but go back to the revenue generation point we talked about earlier i think dallas cowboys generate about 72 dollars per fan manchester united is about 70 cents so that gives you some yeah, that's sort a, of... that's a big, big difference. Yeah, so this is all about then engagement and monetization and, and so on. Um, I mean, the Premier League so far out in front because it's been competitive, it's been exciting. It had that first mover advantage and nobody else can really keep pace with it. La Liga have had to change their revenue distribution rights to try and extend beyond uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona to try and make that competition more competitive, you know, yeah, you've got the, the you've got the Bundesliga wanting to open up to private equity now yeah. um, and investment in because their the ownership model there is is stifling growth and, and isn't quite what they say it is either. and isn't quite what they say it is either. And that's a really important point as well um, when we get into conversation about fan ownership. And the interesting thing there as well with the Premier League example that you mentioned in Saudi is, and we wrote about this as well recently. That's that, that transfer activity actually benefited the Premier League because yeah, recirculation got, of wealth, isn't it? You, that's where the money's coming back in. Yeah. Um, for players that, for some of those players that actually, they wouldn't have commanded that type of fee no. in the European market because they're towards the end of their careers. And suddenly you're getting money for your recruitment, and then you've done your scouting properly and bringing players in, yeah. and, and making a profit on yeah. that. Yeah, and there's a desperation for some of that talent. So a player that might be you know, 28, 29, 30, 31, that you're thinking, hang on, this is a depreciating asset. I'm not going to get, a, we're not going to get our money back here. Somebody in Saudi comes along and says, oh, we'll give you 40 million quid for him. It's 40 million that you probably hadn't budgeted for. So it actually makes you bigger yeah. as a as a product of the of the league in the yeah. Middle East. And, and there is a level of, you know, they had to, the Saudi Pro League had to make some of those plays because mm -hmm. the, the, the star factor that we're mentioning here gets the eyes on the screen and the product in the first instance. So, there is a relatively calculated risk to all of that, and we know that money wasn't, it isn't an objective at this point in time. Mm. But it does, in turn, you know, it doesn't weaken the Premier League if you're talking about it from a competitor point of view. And to close that gap to the Premier League is is probably insurmountable. But there is some long-term growth if you can sustain it and push to, you know, to make a play for the top ten maybe. In but it's going to be 10, 12 years at least. Yeah. I'm, I'm just delighted that someone like Cristiano Ronaldo, who I think was the best player that I've ever seen, can play to at least 50 and score another 400 goals. I mean, there's no doubt he's found the right place to be that. He might play into his 70s, bearing in mind the competition he's around. Um, <laughs> Do you know the interesting thing about him? And, and I, I haven't read a huge amount, and I've certainly not seen a lot, about all the other players that have gone over there. We get a Jordan Henderson thing because of the, the fact that he's still being selected for England. And he did a really bad interview. <laughs> yeah, and a really bad interview. Um but we don't hear a lot about Benzema. I know uh, Neymar's got a big injury. Um, Neves has come into the press because of this loan thing that we're talking about with uh, with partner clubs and, and investment op propositions. But Ronaldo's the one that's getting all the column inches and the TV viewing. Um, He'll be happy with that situation. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure he will be. <laughs> he likes but, the spotlight. But the rest of the the league is not getting the exposure that I think they. I think it's because people aren't, aren't aren't watching it no, no. naturally, and there there isn't any sort of takeoff from that. Well, yeah, know? eyes on eyes on product, eyes on screen will dictate all of that because you know the, there is a TV deal in place, but it's it's 
so minimal in relation to it's the rest of the market. Million, half a million. Uh, uh, half a half a million dollars, isn't it? Yeah, half a million yeah. dollars. Yeah, five so, hundred thousand. Yeah, that is yeah. the and you mentioned the attendances. Those are the other factors that that need to go into the mix in the future to be able to drive the product forward. It, star talent is great, but you've got to have people watching, and that's not just people. The, the people physically watching are a big part of that as well because broadcasters don't want to to show a product that is has an empty, you know, has empty seat has an empty stadium. I want to round off by talking about another product that's going in the right direction in this country in women's football. Mm -hmm. I read, read your work on, on that over the over the past couple of weeks, uh, and the two staggering things there. Yeah, the revenues are climbing amazingly, the costs are climbing up extraordinarily. You know, doubling. Oh, I'm so worried about women's football. It, it's untrue. The but this is kind of a secret that's not being said because everyone everyone is kind of worshipping at the ground of the, the lionesses. I think people are scared of, of talking about sustainable business practice and they use the men's game as a reference point, as a benchmark. And if, if player X can earn £300,000 a week, it's only right that a female footballer can also earn £300,000 a week. We forget that some of these women teams don't turn over 300000 a year. And for all the... For all the brilliance of the lionesses for all the additional branding the advertising the commercial development of the game for all the revenue that's going in and there is increasing revenue going in a lot of that is coming from partner clubs which we tend to forget about because we can offset it against covid losses um the amount of expenditure is really really concerning and i would never stop people from earning a good wage from from what they want to do but we've really got to stop this reference point of the men's game because if they continue to use it the the women's game will be over before it's even started it so, will be so bankrupt. what do they have to put in place then to, to ensure that doesn't happen obviously reality in terms of a reality check and thinking about wages and things like that but there has to be a structure that's then sustainable as well doesn't it yeah i think so i think it needs to stand on its own two feet i think you need to to cut the to cut the um the the, the feeding tube, for want of a better analogy, from the from the men's team that's that's given them whatever it is three, four, five hundred thousand a year to run, um, and I think it needs to really generate its own revenues. And it's great that it's on free to air a lot of the time. Um, you know, you can tune into it on on B one or B two normally on a, a Sunday. They've just got to incrementally progress to trying to take these big leaps forward. And I think it's really dangerous. And you've got to bring everybody along on that journey so you you know alluding yeah. to the fact there about the connections for some of those women's teams with the the men's side of the organization and the overall company structure that creates the haves and the have-nots because not every women's team has that at their you know disposal and that's a problem then for the sport and integrity moving forward and you know there's all manner of conversations there that we need to consider but that that reference to you know the men's game is the the point is absolutely right we need to stop that but we're still having, you know, we talked a lot on the, on this podcast about we kind of feel like there's there's almost like this crossroads in the men's game with all the, the kind of colliding factors that we're talking about. Women's football is also at a crossroads in that regard, but a very different one. But there are similar principles that we're talking about around governance and the league structure and who owns it. And, and they are talking about potentially a split between the WSL and, and the championship mm. below in governance terms and they might so go their own have, ways. So it will be the haves and have nots then. Mm. Which could create a position of the haves and the have nots, which could undo some of all the positive growth that we've seen. And and I still think it will grow. Don't get me wrong. I think but we're, but the we're danger is you repeat the same mistakes as the men's that, game where you just have the high the, earners in the Premier League that's and stuff. That's, that's the, the fear. danger. Yeah. Absolutely the fear right now. And and they've I mean, they've almost de facto removed some of the founding members. You know, I remember speaking to Doncaster Rovers Bells, uh, no longer part of the WSL, yet they were an elite team because they wanted to bring in one of the Premier League's big six. I think it might have been Man City, although don't quote me on that. I know we're on record, but I'm not sure if it was Man City. Um, Sheffield FC, world's oldest football club, had a women's team in the, t in the top two divisions, no longer part of that. So whilst there has to be progress and the commercialisation aspect is important, I think we need to accept a slightly different structure where the the women's game currently needs to be formed around the national competition and the national team because that's where you get your big exposure through the lionesses, unlike what we see in the men's game, which is all based around the, the club game. And then we have to have a regulatory practice that uh, is built around earned and unearned income, going back to that, um, where those uh, those women's teams are able to earn their own income for the right reasons and they can then grow that grow the game incrementally thereafter. And that opportunity is is 
the here and now and the critical nature of that is that you do only have one chance to do that and we've talked a lot today about American sports and English football and, and those kind of decisions that are made in the American case 50, 60 years ago that set the frameworks of the league yeah. dictate what happened throughout the course of history. The Premier League and its formation dictated a lot of what we're talking about now in the men's side of the game in terms of some of the challenges. You only have the opportunity to to start from afresh which is more or less where the WSL is at um, despite it being you know nearly 10 years old as well but it now has a real opportunity to to start afresh with really sound principles and a strategic plan for growth yeah. and you don't get those opportunities too often no and whatever they do they cannot sell out to pay tv they have to stay on terrestrial free to air yeah. we saw it with rugby league when they were um i remember james you might remember dan doesn't when we used to watch grandstand on a saturday afternoon you get half a game of the challenge challenge cup, cup yeah. average audience 2.3 million people on a saturday afternoon watching that half a game of rugby league Move to Sky for a big paycheck, it's about ninety million over set number uh, set number of years. Launch the Super League, two point three million went down to two hundred and thirty thousand. Now that's just numbers, but when you start to see the ripple effect of that, you then get a reduction in participation. So we looked at last uh, Sporting and Active People Service, like twenty three thousand people in the London borough playing rugby league because nobody knows about the game. Um, which then has a knock-on effect to the franchise system, which then has a knock-on effect to the financial prosperity of that league. I really, really fear the Women's Super League selling out to a big contract from a from a pay TV broadcaster that will just completely kill its uh, audiences. And that would be the worst thing it could possibly do because it's got a niche market right now, family environment, different type of... Uh, demographic that's going to watch the games versus the men's game and they could capitalise on that if they stay on free to air. I want to finish with some perspective and context and that's to say we've been wringing our hands over the state of football and football finances but I think every sport in this country and lots of sports across Europe would kill to be in this position and have the problems that, that British football's got. That's fair to say, isn't it? I think that that is absolutely part of the narrative and, and you know we often, we've used that phrase today already it's it's the number of zeros on the end of the pound sign but a lot of these sports are suffering similar financial problems similar challenges the the, the other side of that is that they've perhaps not got the growth potential in the market that that football has and we've alluded to a couple of examples you know cricket's another interesting one in this country the way in which they've you know looked at different types of formats of the game to try and drive growth uh, try and drive growth and revenue but football always come we always come back to this position of football as the market leader and, and the dominant force in the market and and the stats will bear that out so yeah i think there are both sides of that argument there are you know a lot of other sports that would would kill for that there's probably a few that are looking at it going as we're talking about with women's football actually that's all well and good but that's not the model we should be looking at because there's a lot of problems within that historical framework as well the uk's biggest economic export in sport the Premier League, two and a half thousand different countries, however many hours every single week. It is broadcast to all four corners of the globe, bar about two countries, I think. Yeah. The envy of, I would say the envy of the NFL, actually, even though the NFL's bigger in financial terms, the viewing figures that the Premier League can generate on a global basis yeah. is why we're seeing sports like the NFL uh, come across into Europe and host games at Wembley, at Spurs, the uh, broadcasting they um, in Germany a little while ago so yeah for all of its pitfalls and it keeps us in a job by the way you know we we get to talk about this stuff with people like you and and the team at VSI the reality is it is a seriously seriously successful product gentlemen thank you uh, I want to finish with an apology firstly Dan for calling you a sidekick you're a lot more than that it's not Batman and Robin it's Batman and He's Superman the brain. that's been <laughs> praying away at my head for the whole of that podcast. So I'm so sorry for using that term because that was absolute rubbish. Keep being experts within this kind of wall of noise about football finance and thank you for your company. That was educational. That told you everything you needed, where football is, where sport is, where finance is. Look out for our next VSI Sporting Directors podcast coming very soon on whichever platform you're watching and listening to us.